I'm Kalia, identity woman, and I'm going to share with you a spectrum of identity that will help contextualize all the things you heard today, along with a legal innovation that I think we need to actually support democracy and free speech in our world as it becomes more and more digital. But before I do that, I wanted to share a few stories about me and my identity, along with defining identity. So what is identity? It is socially constructed and contextual. And with this, you can pretty much explain all the different things that people call identity, because they all end up coming back to where you are socially and how that social situation informs who you are relative to that space. This is me at the height of my first career. Uh, the pictures on the right are me in college playing. And on the left is a picture of me a couple months before I went to Pan American Games and won a gold medal there with my team, the Canadian National Water Polo Team. And being a water polo player was a huge part of my identity at the time. That is who I thought of myself being and, and what I did in the world and who I was. I was a water polo player. That was my identity. And that's what other people thought of me. It was a really big deal to put that identity down and retire after Pan American Games. And I went back to college and played my last year at UC Berkeley as a senior at Cal. What's interesting is at this time on this team, I had a different name. So everybody on the Canadian team knew me as Kalia. If I was at school, you knew me as Kalia. But on that team, I was Lou. And Lou came from two places. One is Early on, I had this bathing suit I would wear that had a giant flower on it. And they sort of tuned into this Hawaiian flower and said, it's Honolulu. And then it became Lulu, and then it just became Lou. And Kalia sounds like Kalua. And so somehow, the name Lou all made sense in this context. And, and besides, it's way easier to yell, yell Lou, pass the ball, than it is to say Kalia. So, to this day, when I order coffee, I tell them my name is Lou. So how did I become Identity Woman? Well, in 2004, I got my first job working with an organization called Identity Commons. And the community around user-centric identity, how people manage their identities online, was just starting to form. We'd run into each other at conferences. And we started a mailing list called the Identity Gang mailing list, and we all started talking about identity online. One of the people who was in that community, Doc Searles, he went around and he asked everyone to start blogging, because we all needed blogs to have identities in space. So Kim had his identity blog, Phil Winley had Technometria, and we needed a cute name for blogs. And I decided I hadn't really run into that many women working in the field, so I decided the title of my blog would be Identity Woman. Kim Cameron, who was the chief identity architect at Microsoft at the time, started publishing the laws of identity. And he released one every week for about seven weeks. And he asked all of us in the community to give feedback. And we do it on our blogs, and we link to each other, and we had these amazing conversations about the ideas that he was putting forward. This is all in the winter of 2005. So here's the paper, it goes along, and then he, he finally published it as a paper, and he thanked everybody who contributed. And everyone else is their first and their last name, and he decided that he would list me as Identity Woman Kalia. And I was like, okay, sure. And I wrote him, I said, you know, that's not my name. Everyone else is first in Latin name. Why did you do this? And he said, well, that's your name. That's how everybody knows you. And I was like, oh, OK. So at that point, I chose to step into the name that people saw me. They referred to me that way and, and really step into being this sort of superhero persona, saving the world with user-centric identity. That's been my tagline since then. There's one more thing that's actually been really important about this, and it's really key to what's going on in some of the issues right now. Google, actually, with NIMWARS, refused to allow me and many other people to use the name that they chose in their headline of their profile. So I listed on my profile, as Google Plus was rolling out, that I was Kalia Identity Woman. 
because this is my professional identity. This has been really important for me because if you hear my name, you can't really spell it, so you can't look it up. If you see my name, you're not really sure how to say it. And identity woman is a little bit longer, but everybody can see and say it. So it's been really key for me being able to define myself. And them saying, no, that's not your name. We're going to tell you what your name is. It's really not right. So this spectrum of identity will give us tools to think about this whole set of issues. So on the one hand, you have anonymous identities. And these can be both per post and per session. So you go to a website like 4chan, and literally every single post that you make is anonymous. It's not even linked to the previous post you did in that same session. There's other video sites where there's chats along the side. When you get there in that session, you pick a handle or you're assigned a number, and you're anonymous within that session. And then you end up on the other end. You have verified identity. And these are within the framework of Western liberal democracies. We've constructed this idea that you get some papers when you're born, and you get some more when you get a driver's license, and you get a passport. They're formal systems of identity related to the state, usually. And you can have various forms. You could just fax in some of your documents to some place that wants to verify your identity. There's in-person proofing, and there's biometric capture. Those are all different forms of identity verification. And it ends up that discussions about identity end up kind of stuck, as if these are the only two forms of identity, and there's nothing in the middle. And there's actually lots there. So right next to anonymous identity, you have pseudonymous identities. Those are identities that you would use either in one site again and again and again, or even on multiple sites, taking it between websites. So gamers often play in a gaming network, and they use the same handle in multiple games. Bloggers, like LiveJournal, people have handles, and they comment on each other's blogs. So those are pseudonyms that are used over long periods of time. And people have pseudonyms now in the digital world that are 10, even 20 years old. Next to verified identity, you have self-asserted and socially validated identities. So self-asserted identities, when you show up somewhere and say, who are you? And you just tell them. And you may fill out those forms accurately or not, but you're just saying who you are. So when I order coffee, I just say, my name's Lou. Nobody blinks. They don't care. As long as I pick up my latte at the other end, everything's cool. Socially validated identities are where we point to each other and say, yes, that's Sam or Bob or Lou. You can do this in systems like Twitter where you're doing it asymmetrically, so you can just follow other people and they don't have to follow you back. Or systems like LinkedIn and Facebook are symmetric follows where you kind of have to follow each other back. So now we can play mix and match and really understand how these different um, things fit together. So my identity, identity woman, is self-asserted. It's a pseudonym. It's socially validated. People point at my blog, refer to me that way all the time. In fact, even here today, someone came up to me and said, you're identity woman, aren't you? And I said, yes. And then it's also linked to the name that I have in my government document. There's pseudonymous, socially validated identities. So these are, in a gaming network, you would refer to other people by their handles. Bloggers refer to each other. People tweet under pseudonyms, but they are followed and followed back. And people have conversations with those identities, even though they may not know who they really are. This is a form of social validation for pseudonyms. They're just as valid as any other type of identity. And in fact, they're super, super important. There's a report that just came out in the last few weeks by Discus about how people with pseudonyms comment more on blogs, and they're more active and participatory, and they really drive online discourse. You have self-asserted and socially validated identities. One great example of this is movie stars in Hollywood. Lots of those folks aren't actually using the name that's on their photo IDs, but everybody knows who they are, and 
agrees that that's their name in most social contexts. Another key thing that I always talk about is when was the last time, did any of you, when you walked in here today, ask people to show you their paperwork to know who they are? No, you just asked them what their name was, and other people around here, if they knew them, would sort of nod and agree. We're doing this all the time in, in our daily lives. How do we get verified anonymity? This is a really interesting type of identity that's emerged in the tech world that's sort of hard to understand because we can't really do it in real life. So this is how it works. So an individual has an identity. So this one is Miss Sudana, and she has a date of birth of January 21st, 1982. So she's 20 years old today, and she lives in Alameda, California. Now she has this in some sort of official issued document that she's given in a digital form. And then with some fancy math, this can be turned into an assertion that says she's over 18 years old, she's a woman voter, and she lives in Congressional District 9 of California. Now she could take this assertion that's, that's, that can be proven to be true, but it doesn't link specifically back to her. If she shared this information, it would. If she sends this information along, it just says, yes, we, we've done the fancy math derived from this real certificate, and, and you should trust that she is who she says she is with these attributes. So there's folks working on tools right now that will allow citizens to go and talk to each other from the same congressional district and actually petition their congresspeople without revealing their real name, but proving that they actually live in their congressional district. We have a challenge. How do you get pseudonyms verified? Now, one of the things that's happening online and in the world is there's an increasing pressure to have verified identities for everything. And I gave a TEDx talk in Brussels in December, and I said, I'm really concerned about this. If we need to have a verified identity, to make a purchase of $50 online, and to do any speech act online. We're not going to live in a free society. And if we have to show our ID all over the place when we move in the physical world, we're not going to live in a free society. But there's real issues people are trying to address. They're trying to create trust. Because they know there's accountability. If you show your, your verified paperwork, then they could go find you if something went wrong. That's really what's needed, is not actually knowing who you are, but knowing that there is a backup mechanism to address transactions gone bad or illegal behavior. We need a new social and legal institution that helps link these two things together so people can have a pseudonym and have it be verified. But if the link is public, it blows the pseudonym. It's a link back to your verified identity that works in a hospital or is a police officer or some kind, any, lots of you I'm sure have professions where political speech isn't really appropriate in certain contexts for your work and you don't want to do it. These are really important tools for a democracy. So we need new institutions that do this. It could be the courts, it could be a, some sort of new nonprofit organization, it could be even companies that start to provide this service. But they then issue to you what has been called a limited liability persona. A new construct that we can create that helps create mechanisms for accountability in the online digital world and even the face-to-face -face world. That means we don't have to have our verified identity to go everywhere. One of the things that's happened in, in the last, I think it's in the last year, is the Citizens United decision gave corporations that they're like people, they have free speech. And this innovation, in effect, gives people the rights of corporations, the ability to do transactions and do speech, but not have it all linked back to them. I hope that in the next year we can see this innovation happen, and thank you very much for your time.